Welcome to this session of the Living Your Best Life with Kidney Disease virtual forum. Thank you to Atsuka Canada and Paladin Labs for providing unrestricted financial support for this forum. Nous remercions Atsuka Canada et Laboratoire Paladin d'avoir apporté un soutien financier sans restriction à ce forum. The information presented in this virtual forum is current as of January 25th and 26th, 2022. The material shared in this presentation is not intended to be medical advice. We suggest people speak to their doctor about their own individual situation. This information is intended for a Canadian audience. Les informations présentées dans le forum virtuel sont à jour en date du 25 et 26 janvier 2022. Le matériel partagé dans cette présentation n'est pas destiné à être un avis médical. Nous suggérons aux gens de parler à leur médecin de leur situation personnelle. Cette information est destinée à un public canadien. Hello and welcome everyone to day two of a Living Well with Kidney Disease, Coping, Resilience and Wellbeing Forum. Yesterday was a great day and we're excited to share more information and resources with you today. You'll hear from kidney patient about her experience and several social workers who will review federal programs. We will provide information to help you find what you need and get the most out of the systems out there. I'm really happy to be here and introduce you to our panelists for today. Anna Crazy is a registered social worker at the Sunnybrook Hospital in Toronto, Ontario. Anna works in the multidisciplinary kidney care clinics with individuals receiving in-center hemodialysis. Anna started in nephrology seven years ago. Um, Anna provides education, emotional and practical support for individuals impacted by this illness and empowers them through their journey with kidney disease. Jody Max has been working in the kidney transplant program at St. Paul's Hospital in Vancouver, BC since 2015. She's currently serving as the BC representative of the Canadian Association of Nephrology Social Workers, or as we affectionately know them, CANSWA. Jody has been a social worker for 25 years, graduated from McGill and UBC. I'd also like to acknowledge our behind the scenes colleagues who are supporting us to help create the content for today's sessions. Michelle Jensen, Sylvia Jurdis, and Shannon Fogarassi. And of course, uh, Bibi Jalfraley. Bibi has been on in-center dialysis for the past seven years and counting. She had to stop working due to losing her home and ended up living in a motel. During her kidney journey, she had to choose between living in a shelter, figuring out what to eat and how to access food and pay for her medication. Bibi's story is a true inspiration and support for others. Before we start our discussion this afternoon or this morning, depending on where you are, we would like to share a short video featuring Bibi that was made for the Kidney Foundation. Janice, could you kindly share the video? When I first was diagnosed with kidney failure, I had two detached retinas. Uh, my surgeon had some blood work and found that my kidney uh, function had started to decrease. And then about four years ago, um, I had to start dialysis. Because of the kidney failure and the lack of calcium, it has weakened my bones. Um, I ended up with a charcoal foot from it. Um, so now I'm in a wheelchair. Financially, the impact has been severe for me. Um, I went from working in uh, a really good business environment, uh, doing a really good job, um, to not being able to work at all, trying to live on disability, um, and the income that we get from disability is not a lot. So financially, I'm homeless at the moment. I'm living in a motel. I, I can't even begin to say how bad it's been. When you're on dialysis, you're, you're facing a, a lot. I mean, it's a very, very uh, physical, 
uh, challenges for you. It can be uh, a drain physically, it can be a drain emotionally, um, it can be a drain financially. I mean, think about it, three times a week you're going in and, and getting hooked up to a machine and this machine is cleaning your blood and that machine is what's keeping you alive. But in going through all of this, it's just, it's physically draining. A lot of people can't actually maintain any sort of quality of, or very minimal quality of life associated with those who are not on dialysis. So it's, it's hard to work, maintain a, a, a full-time job. Um, it can be very emotional as well. Um, and it's very draining on you. It's very draining on your, on your family. And you also have a financial strain. A lot of people on dialysis report uh, household incomes of less than 35 $35,000 a year, and about a quarter of the dialysis patients report household incomes of less than $20,000 a year. So then when you're adding another $2,500 a year uh, associated with these transportation or uh, medication costs, it's, it's really quite daunting. And how do you meet that? It, it's difficult living in a place like this because it's very small. You don't have any privacy. Um, I mean, my, I can't even get into the shower without my son because it's not wheelchair accessible. It's changed his life the most. And I feel very sorry for him because it's very hard for him. He's a young man and nobody at 21 should have to start taking care of their, their parent. And I'm lucky because I know people that are living in their cars right now because they have no other option. They can't afford it. For individuals who are applying to various financial support programs such as ODSP or CPB disability, these processes and, and documents can be very difficult to work through. Um, so sometimes navigating through these systems, figuring out where to get these documents, how to access them, how to apply for them, how to complete them become very challenging and for a lot of individuals they need a little bit of additional assistance in trying to navigate through those systems and to properly ensure that they get the adequate funding that they need to support themselves while they're you know, receiving dialysis treatments and, and caring for their chronic illness. I was always a very strong, independent woman. I always did for myself, and now I can't do for myself. And I have to depend on others. I don't like it. You, it really reduces you. It really reduces how you are as a person, how you feel as a human being. The short-term financial assistance program, as it is offered to individuals who are in need, um, there is often a response of surprise that uh, there is this assistance available to them. Um, but right after the surprise comes uh, a feeling of, of some sort of, of relief. I'm so grateful to the Kidney Foundation for helping me. They've given me some donations to help me uh, make ends meet. Financially, it's, it's a great burden, and I wish there was more help out there for dialysis patients. You know, we might be able to offer $100 or $200, which helps to bridge that gap of, you know, the, the financial challenge at that moment, but it's not a cure and it's not a fix. We all have the ability to do something about this. We can, we can draw awareness to the needs that are there, to the needs that, the, that dialysis patients have, particularly around the financial strain that they're facing. We need to, to raise our, base, our voices, make people aware, make the, the broader community aware, and in particular, make our elected officials aware. I'm sharing my story because people need to know. The government needs to know, people need to know that there are people struggling like me with kidney disease, that's struggling hard. It's not my fault that I'm sick. It's something that happened. It's something that I have to accept. But do I have to be punished for it? No. Do I need help? Absolutely. Can I get help? Yes, with the people like the Kidney Foundation.
That's where my help is. Thank you, Bibi, for sharing that story with us today. Um, look forward to speaking and uh, about your situation now a little bit later on, and uh, and I'm sure there'll be plenty of questions and, and comments that people would like to make. Um, but before we move forward, I'd like to introduce our moderator for this session, Corinne McNabb. Um, mm. Corinne has been with the Regional Kidney Care Program of Simcoe Muskoka in Aurelia, Ontario since 1999, working with patients in the multi-kidney care clinic and patients on hemodialysis, both in centre and in satellite units. Corinne is passionate about palliative care, ethics and truth-telling. She is the clinical palliative care champion for the Ontario Renal Network and is currently the president of CANSWA, the Canadian Association of Nephrology Social Workers. Corinne, um, I'm very pleased to hand it over to you and uh, we were up to uh, Jody and Anna presenting some important information. Welcome. Thank you, Lydia. Sorry, everybody had some technical issues, but I'd like to thank the Kinney Foundation of Canada today for inviting us to participate in this patient forum. It's always a pleasure to partner with the Kidney Foundation and I'm happy to, to be here. So now um, uh, Jody and Anna will present some information about financial resources that may be available to you. Um, a PDF document of the resources is available on the Kidney Foundation website where you registered for this event. So don't feel you, um, and they're sharing the, the link there in the chat. So don't feel you have to scribble away notes as they're speaking. Um, we'll also leave plenty of time uh, for questions at the end of the presentation. So Janice, if you could please share the presentation. Um, yeah, and let Jody and Anna take it away. Thank you, Corinne, and, uh, and thank you, Bibi. Yes, I look forward to hearing from you uh, later, Bibi. So hi, everybody. I'm hoping you can all hear me. Should I check that first? Yes, okay, great, <laughs> thank you. So um, can we get the next slide, please? So we've put together um, a presentation just to give you a brief overview of everything that's available federally, so Canada-wide, obviously because this is a Canadian uh, presentation, we can't cover each province, that would take a very long time, but we will repeat frequently that we, we, we encourage you to talk to the social worker associated with whatever kidney program you're attached to because they will be able to help you with specific resources for your province and in your area that can also help you get through these. So this is what we're going to be reviewing today. We're going to be going over employment insurance benefits, Canadian pension plan disability benefits, the disability tax credit, the registered disability savings plan, what supports are available through the Kidney Foundation, and then we've got some tips for finding resources for yourself. So next slide, please. So the first thing we're gonna just review is employment insurance sickness benefits. So for those of you who don't know, this is a benefit available for folks maybe when their kidney disease is progressing and they're starting to um, feel symptomatic and are unable to work. So as long as you've worked 600 hours in the previous year um, and you have a doctor who will sign the form to basically confirm that yes, you're unable to work due to medical reasons, you can get EI benefits for up to 15 weeks. And the amount you get is going to vary based on the income you earned, but it is 55% of what your average weekly earnings are up to a maximum of 547 a week. So of course that is um, a lot less than whatever you were making before, which is why we're reviewing all sorts of benefits you can access in the meantime, um, as we heard from, from Bibi's uh, very difficult journey uh, it's very hard when your income drops and it can affect obviously everything, housing, food, everything. So we want to really make sure you know what's available for you and that you're getting uh, help from your social workers to access all of these benefits. So it is an application you can do online. And again, your, your social worker can help you with that if, uh, if you don't have online access or internet access or a computer. 
Um, and then just a note for anybody who may be running their own self-employed business, you actually can pay into EI so that it covers you if you do end up needing to be sick. Um, again, the details of how much that would cost are going to be specific to whatever you're doing, but it's something to consider if you're able to. Okay, thank you. Next slide, please. Oh, and I did want to just make a point. There are obviously specific COVID related benefits. We're not covering those, but you can certainly talk to your social worker about that. Those have been ever changing since the beginning of the pandemic. So the Canadian Pension Plan disability benefit is another option for those who have worked, um, for those who have worked at least four of the last six years and are under the age of 65. Um, so this is different from the provincial disability benefits that you may be aware of in whatever province you're in. And this is a federal program given by the government of Canada. So there's quite an extensive, a, a long sort of complicated application that needs to be done. And it includes getting, um, you know, a medical portion completed by your medical team and it's not just a temporary disability, it has to be something that your medical team thinks is likely to go on for many years and is severely interfering with your ability to function. So um, you can apply for this uh, either, either online or by mail, and it can be a long processing time, especially with extra COVID delays right now, the government is backlogged with everything. Um, but again, your, your social worker can help. And the other thing that is important to keep in mind too is um, most of the major cities are going to have some sort of disability advocate program. So for example, I'm, I'm in Vancouver, BC, and we have a group called the Disability Alliance here. And we will often refer any of our patients who are applying for this disability benefit or the provincial disability benefits to get in touch with an advocate because the advocates are experts who know the exact language to use on all the different applications, whether it's provincial disability or Canadian pension plan disability. There are certain key phrases that the folks who are reviewing them and are giving the stamp of approval are looking for. And so those expert advocates are the ones who will be able to give you your best shot of getting approved. And they're doing these applications all the time. Whereas your social worker may not be doing them regularly. I know I certainly don't do them regularly. So I would much rather my patient have the best option for them. So do ask your social worker for um, the connection to whatever disability advocate may be in your area. And then, of course, um, how much your Canadian pension plan is going to be if you are approved is going to depend on what the income you've earned over the years and how much you've contributed over the years. Um, similarly to what I had said about employment insurance, if you're self-employed, you can certainly pay into CPP as well. Uh, okay, thank you. So next slide, please. So the disability tax credit is another federal benefit. Now, basically, this is only helpful if you already pay taxes. If your income is so low that you don't pay taxes, this is not actually going to benefit you because it's not going to give you actual cash, but it is going to reduce the amount of taxes that you pay. So if you're on dialysis, whether hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis, that automatically meets the criteria to get this disability tax credit and your social worker, your dialysis social worker will easily be able to help you complete this form. Um, you know, we have sort of cut and paste language that we use on all of the forms that just gets people automatic approval. And it's really important to start uh, to apply for this earlier in your journey rather than waiting till later. I'm on the transplant side of things, and sometimes I see patients who've gotten their kidney transplant, but they've never had the disability tax credit. And once you have a transplant, you're actually considered to have a well-managed kidney disease at that point. So you're not technically considered disabled anymore. So it would be a question of getting them for retroactive. So the years before when you did qualify, and it can be a lot trickier to have to then go back to the dialysis team and get the team to do that. It's not impossible. It of course can happen, but it, it also means you can benefit from it earlier as soon as you apply for it. Um, so always for all of these, we encourage you to start as early as possible. Okay, 
Thank you. And then uh, the next program is the Retirement Disability Support Program. Now, I particularly feel very excited about this one because it is, it is literally free money that the government gives people. Now, it's really beneficial and only actually you get the free money if you're under 50. So if you are under 50 yourself and you don't yet have a retirement disability support program, uh, so actually, I think it's the savings program. Actually, my, my apologies. I actually am not sure. Maybe it is the support program, but it, it actually is a savings program. So what happens is when you register, the government will match um, up to $3 of every dollar you put into the savings program. And this money is exempt from any provincial disability that you're receiving. So if somebody's on Ontario disability benefits or BC disability benefits, this money is protected and it's not considered income. So if someone ends up coming into an inheritance or they end up with kidney disease early on in their lives in their twenties or thirties, this can be really beneficial to sign up for this. The most awesome thing I just learned about this is if your income is so low that you don't have any money to put into a savings program yourself, the government will contribute $1,000 a year for up to 20 years for you. And this is literally free money. So I know our social workers comment that it's very uh, rare that people actually have these. So we really want to encourage you to talk to your social worker to get one for yourself if you do qualify. If you're between the ages of 50 and 60, you can still have this savings plan and be part of this RDSP, but you don't get the free money from the government. You just basically can put money aside that won't be considered, uh, won't affect your, your provincial disability benefits. Um, there are lots of free workshops on how to do this because it is a little bit tricky and complicated. We have a, um, in, at the end of the program, and, and Anna will be talking a little bit about this, uh, we have resources and benefits. And as, as Corinne said earlier, uh, a list of different things that you can take away with you. And there's a, an organization Canada wide that specifically, um, yes, I know the RDSP, I'm just responding to a chat message saying that uh, I actually didn't realize the RDSP could benefit people who have no income or have very low income as well. So it really is a great plan to take advantage of if you can. Um, and so there's an organization that's Canada wide, which specializes in getting people access to this, and they have free webinars, free workshops, a phone number you can call and people will walk you through every step of the way to help make sure you can get access to this. So please, please do if you can. And if if you know other people who um, are under 50 who don't know about this, please do spread the word far and wide. So with that, I will hand over to my colleague, Anna, to continue from here. Thank you so much, Jody. Just doing a quick uh, volume and sound check. Hopefully everyone can hear me all right. Thank you. Um, thank you. It's my pleasure to be here. Um, very informative. Um, presentation so far, and I will just continue where Jody left off. I will be presenting some information on the Kinti Foundation of Canada Short-Term Financial Assistance Program, as well as some individual provincial social assistance programs and uh, programs um, dedicated for covering, help cover the cost of medications. Um, so thank you, Janice, for putting the slides up. Um, and first off is the Kidney Foundation of Canada Short-Term Financial Assistance Program. Um, so this is a unique opportunity for individuals who struggle with kidney disease to apply for um, a funding program. It's, it originated with the Kidney Foundation, which is a national charity committed to improving the lives of individuals with kidney disease. Interesting side fact is, is that it started with 50 volunteers back in the 1960s, and now it has branches in every province. And um, the short-term financial assistance programs uh, provide support services and a ton of information to, uh, to individuals who are struggling with kidney illness. It's truly meant as financial support of last resort, and it's meant really as a bridge um, 
short-term uh, financial opportunity until a long-term plan is put in place. And it helps cover such um, aspects such as transportation to and from dialysis appointments, medication costs, nutritional supplements, as well as emergency living expenses. So the total um, value or the total amount of support that an individual can apply for on an annual basis is $500. And there is specific application as well as eligibility criteria. And it's best to speak to your a program social worker who will be able to help explain and review the eligibility criteria to make sure that you meet the needs um, as well as help you with the application. Um, thank you, uh, Janice. Uh, can we move forward to the next slide? Great. Um, so now I will briefly review um, provincial programs that help assist covering the cost of medications. And I will specifically um, look uh, at the Ontario program. So each province has public as well as private plans that help cover the costs of medications. These plans typically have a, a copay or a deductible. In Ontario, there is three widely no, known plans. The ODP, which is designed for our seniors, so individuals who are 65 years of age and older and who already have eligible OHIP coverage, healthcare coverage. Um, the ODP plan helps cover um, prescription drugs. OHIP Plus is um, another provincial plan for individuals who are under 25 years of age and there is no deductible with this plan. And lastly, the Trillium Drug Program is designed for individuals who are 25 to 65 years of age. The deductible is personalized based on the total household income. Um, and it's best to speak to a social worker or a renal pharmacist to help with the application because they will be better able and suited to answer questions regarding the nuances of each individual um, deductible situation. Um, I know a lot of our patients who are on dialysis and who are on the journey towards receiving transplant um, have multiple questions about Trillium uh, and their individual deductibles. And I always direct them to either myself, my colleagues, or um, the, the renal um, pharmacist as well. Um, next slide, please, Janice. Uh, this one actually was a duplicate. We apologize about this, but if we can move forward and our next slide, sorry about that. <laughs> um, great. Um, so, um, Individuals um, who are struggling financially and, meet, and need uh, basic needs, support, and coverage can also qualify for social assistance programs. Again, these will vary province by province, and I will uh, talk in general terms about the uh, programs that we have in Ontario. So we have the Ontario Works, which is widely known as OW, and it's for people who are 16 plus live in Ontario and have um, financial, financial uh, are struggling financially. Um, there's multiple ways that you can apply for the support and the maximum um, monthly income that you can expect to receive from OW would be anywhere close to $700. Um, the benefit of OW is that you get a chance to work with a caseworker who can help you financially uh, with the application as well as also assist you with the job search moving forward. And from OW, uh, you can also transition to ODSP, which is the Ontario Disability Support Program. Um, and the ODSP actually has two-part criteria. It's based on your financial need as well as um, ensuring that the disability that one has um, meets specific criteria. So your disability will be assessed as well as your financial eligibility. Um, and the dis in order to meet the criteria for ODSP, your disability should be expected to last for at least a year. Um, and of course, have a significant impact on your daily living. Um, as well, there are also employer-based income programs that I encourage um, a lot of my patients to clarify with their employers. And these can be things like short-term as well as long-term disability. 
and uh, of course extended healthcare benefits. So again, depending on your each unique situation, it's probably best to speak to a social worker as well as your human resources department to um, discuss various supports that may be available to you. Uh, thank you, next slide. And um, we decided to also put some general tips in terms of finding resources for yourself. Um, I know that a lot of people, really everyone is, you know, has been impacted by the COVID pandemic and everyone has unique needs and struggling in multiple different ways. And um, really it's, it's good to be able to, um, go out and, and ask for help if needed, but also be able to look for assistance specifically depending on your individual needs. So again, it's best to speak with your social worker and discuss your current concerns and needs, know your community agencies as well as neighborhood centers um, and the supports that are available. And next slide, sorry. And some more um, specific um, resources and coping mechanisms as well as self-care techniques. Um, it, it would be nice in an ideal world if each social worker working with each kidney disease patient um, had the opportunity to sit down and do one-on-one -on -one counseling and provide, you know, really comprehensive in-depth support and um, assistance, whether it's emotional or practical or functional assistance. However, unfortunately, it's just not the reality right now because of huge caseload numbers and just so many individuals negatively impacted uh, by kidney disease. Um, that's why it's, we, we, in putting this um, presentation together, we thought it would be important to give um, our patients and our viewers some takeaway uh, resources as well as helpful hints and tips um, in terms of being able to um, look for help and seek help on your own. So last few years have been very challenging for all. You've heard terms like unprecedented times and never ending, um, never ending challenges and just really difficulty with planning and the multiple unknowns that have been, that we've all been experiencing. Um, what is helpful to know and to realize is that, you know, certain things are within our control, uh, while others are not. So it's hard for us to imagine, you know, living through another year of COVID or um, suffering through another emergent uh, variant, if you will. Hopefully it doesn't happen. <laughs> um, but um, what we can control is our own reaction to stressors and how we perceive certain situations. And it's helpful to know coping strategies that work for you um, and for your immediate family. Uh, so reaching out to individuals that you trust, that you love and that care for you is um, definitely something that I would recommend as well as um, you know, not being shy and uh, speaking to your social workers, speaking to your healthcare team members, voicing your concerns because surely there will be a member of your team who will if not help you directly, at least be able to help and guide you um, to somebody who can assist as needed. Um, I think that's it for me. I know we prepared a number of resources as well as uh, links that may be helpful to the general public. And I believe that those will be shared further down in the presentation. Thank you, Corinne. Well, thank you so much, Anna and Jody. And I see lots of questions coming into the Q&A and there's some um, messages in the chat, lots of them for BB. So um, before we get to the, the question and answer session though, we have another opportunity to, to hear BB live. Um, I had an opportunity to speak with her on the phone for a few minutes individually while we were planning this session. And I just wanted to share with you some key words that I took away from our discussion, um, acceptance, positive outlook, left with knowledge and information, and took back control. So 
BB, thank you for sharing your your uh, your video with us. And now um, I think you're going to tell us in a um, in your own way how you are doing now. And um, then we will. I have a few other questions for you as you finish. So, BB, are you on with us? Yes, I am. Okay. So, hi everyone. <laughs> tell us how you're doing now. Now I'm doing a lot better, thank God. I do have a home that I have wheelchair accessibility. I have food in my fridge, my medication. I really have come a long way in the last three years. And I am just thankful for the support that I got from the Kidney Foundation. They really helped me quite a bit. And I'm just grateful and thankful for the rest of the people around me that helped me through this. So looking at my story, it brought tears to my eyes. It brought emotion, raw emotion, because I don't ever want to get back to a place like that. That was not a good place to be in. So I am grateful and thankful for where I am now. So BB, I'm not sure if you have access to the, the chat, but there are lots of messages of support and lots of people who were saying that they, they also had tears in their eyes watching your video and um, wishing you well. And um, yeah. So what would you say was the most important lesson you learned throughout your journey so far? Well, like I said, um, acceptance is a big thing. You have to take control and you have to accept what is going on in your life. You have to accept that you have kidney disease. You have to accept that you're on dialysis, that your life has changed and will continue to change. And going forward, it has to be for the better. Very inspirational. Um, where would you say your strength comes from? My strength comes from, firstly, faith, um, the belief in God and myself, um, from my family, and just being able to know that um, they, I do have people out there that care, that care about what happens to me. Um, the Kidney Foundation is one. I've met some great people along my journey. Um, my doctors. It, every day is a new experience. Every day is an inspiration. You have to get up with positivity. You have to carry your life with positivity. Okay. Well, so what... What message would you like to pass along to other kidney patients who may be facing <clears throat> similar struggles and who are listening to your story today? Well, the one thing I want to say is access your resources. Find where you can get help. Don't become uh, a person that is losing hope. Don't become a person that um, doesn't look at all their options. You have to look at your options. You have to find where you can get help and you have to access it. Okay. Well, thank you so much. You're just a real um, inspiration to everybody. And, and uh, I'm so glad that you're in a better place and you know, that you have such a positive outlook. It's a real lesson to all of us, how you can come from, from somewhere and, and get to a, a really a different place. So we wish you all the best, yeah. BB. Thank you for sharing life, your story. Life is a journey. I'm, we're all on this journey. For sure. Yeah. Well, thank you again. Thank you. Okay. Now, I think um, we're going to open up the session for some question and answer. And Jody has let me know that there are some questions in the Q&A that she'd like to answer 
uh, live. Um, I know there's been some furious typing in there. Um, so Jody, I'm gonna let you go ahead. Thank you. And um, uh, I'm sorry if there's gonna be overlap, but I know that there's been some typing and I uh, just wanted to throw in what I see here and there may be some I'm missing, but there were a few questions um, that I'd like to mention. So the, there was a question about for CPP disability, if you're self-employed, can you pay retroactively or how do you find out how to do this? The main thing I would say is you can go online and there's a CPP website or a, and a phone number. So I just tried to do a very quick uh, Google search and you can certainly do that. So for those who have access to a computer, if you do a Google search and type in whatever your question is, and this goes into another question, how do you find out if there's an advocate in your area? You can do a Google search and, and type in disability advocates. And if you're in a small area, you should do it for the closest major city. So someone from Alberta had asked. So I would suggest doing a search for Edmonton or Calgary, for example. And advocates in those um, cities are going to be able to help you with a provincial application because it's the same across the province. Going back to the CPP disability piece, you can call the CPP disability line. You may have to be on hold for a while, but when you get through to somebody, you can certainly ask them specifics about your situation if you're self-employed. I don't know the answer about whether it can be retroactive or not, um, but they should be able to give you advice on that. Um, and then there was an important question about how do you get access to a social worker with things being virtual right now, or sometimes there's short shortages and sometimes social workers have left the program and the, the uh, position might be vacant for a little while. So that is really a challenging situation that a lot of people are facing across the country. So if you do actually have a social worker attached to your program, what you can do is if you don't already have contact with them, you can ask your nurse to put you in contact with them and the social worker will reach out to you and make a time to either meet by phone or video or of course if you're um, on hemodialysis uh, in one of the daytime slots, they can come and see you when you're on dialysis. Um, and if there is no social worker in your particular program, if there's a gap, you can ask to, again, to talk to the nurse to connect you with a social worker in a nearby major city who's in the same province as you. And they should be able to talk you through um, specifics about resources like we're talking about now, because, you know, every province is going to have uh, some slight variations. I know there was a lot of uh, notes going around as well that the, um, the actual amount that you can access through the Kidney Foundation for short term financial assistance does vary slightly from the provinces. So again, it's just always really important to talk to your social worker if you have one or the closest social worker if you don't. All right, I'll stop now and see if anybody else, uh, Anna, if you wanted to add anything or, or Corrine. Yeah, I just, sorry, Anna, can I just jump in? Um, I, in our program, we do CPP disability and um, the Ontario Provincial Disability uh, forms quite frequently. And so I think that probably varies. And I know, Jody, when you're working with transplant patients, you probably don't, <laughs> don't, don't do them as often. But I think a lot of the social workers in the programs, I would start there. Um, but as Jody says, I think the other uh, thing you can do is contact the Kidney Foundation. They do have lists in each province of all the social workers in, in their province and they're in contact with them. So they could probably connect you with a social worker that's close to your home. So I would, I would say that that's probably a good place to start if you don't have a good connection in your program. But as Jody says, you can always ask your nurse or charge nurse or your doctor or nurse practitioner. And if there is a social worker in your program, they would, I'm sure, connect you with them. Anna, did you have anything to add to that? Thank you. I think both Jody and Corinne uh, covered most ground. Uh, similar, uh, I work at Sunnybrook. Uh, we are uh, lucky to have five social workers on staff. Uh, and unfortunately, some absences right now. Uh, so virtually, we work with a number of patients in kidney care clinic, as well as patients on dialysis. We also always ask for individual preferences. Some people find it easier to meet face-to-face -to, -face to discuss 
whatever circumstances they need assistance with and others are, are actually more comfortable discussing on the phone or virtually through Zoom meetings. Again, recognize that this may not be, um, these platforms may not be accessible and easily available to everyone, but it is best to reach out to your nurse as well as program coordinator or a team leader to help connect with a social worker because most programs have, if not a social worker, then at least they can connect you to a neighborhood social worker. For sure. Now there was a, a comment in the, um, the Q&A as well that there are some community agencies usually in your area as well that would have caseworkers and social workers. And that is true. Um, unfortunately, there are some very specific things that with renal and nephrology that are, are specific. Um, and we are probably, we just have more experience with it because we've been working with it. So yes, yeah, so you can you can start there, but you may find that um, especially with filling out those documents, there may be um, some special language as I think Jody referenced that. So phrases or some language that we can use in regards to your, your kidney disease that the community social worker may not know. Um, and we can also help advocate if you have, um, if you need the forms fill out, filled out by a nephrologist, we can help with that piece as well. So um, are there any other questions? I did see a couple of questions that there was one directly for BB and then there was one for the Kidney Foundation. Okay. Um, the one, let's go back to the one for BB. Uh oh, can I find it now? <laughs> oh, um, Lori had asked, can you tell us specifically what resources you got to change your financial situation from being dire to better now? Well, um, I was able to uh, secure a housing facility. Um, so that helped in terms of my rent, um, giving me a little bit extra money. Um, that I could survive. And, you know, there's, um, like you said, um, you can apply to the Kidney Foundation once a year if you need a bridge or you need something to tie you over. So that's always there. Okay. I hope that helped. Thanks, Phoebe. Great, okay, and then Linda had a question for the Kidney Foundation saying that she recalls the Kidney Foundation was engaging in some form of advocacy around income support policies for renal patients. Is this still a current interest and is there a way to get involved? Um, she's a graduate political science and sociology student and would be interested in this as a patient with lived experience. Thank you so much, Jody. Um, yes, Linda, you know, we, we work on advocacy at so many levels at the foundation and uh, there's many opportunities to become involved. I'm actually sending you a little message uh, with my email address and uh, feel free to reach out. But if anybody does want to be involved in any advocacy or any uh, uh, future kind of um, campaigns or uh, things that we're working on, please reach out to us at kidneyprograms at kidney.ca and I'll, I'll pop that in the chat. Great, thanks, Lydia. So I, I actually see a question that I can answer here. Somebody asked if they've gotten a kidney transplant, are they still considered a renal patient? Absolutely, you're still considered a renal patient if you have a kidney transplant. Um, the good news is you're technically no longer considered considered disabled once you have gotten a kidney transplant and it's going well. And as, as some of you may know, um, kidney transplants uh, can last uh, anywhere from 10, 15, 20, 25 years where people can live healthy, active lives and can live fairly normal lives or completely normal lives. Obviously that doesn't apply for everybody. It doesn't always, um, you know, people don't always have a smooth recovery and things don't always go that well. But if things are going well for you, that means you don't necessarily qualify for most of the disability benefits that we've been reviewing here. So that brings me back to a question about the disability tax credit. Um, so I know Michelle answered that the disability tax credit will get, a, if you get approved for it, the letter of approval you get will clarify how long you're approved for it, but it is not um, a forever thing. And 
generally they ask people to, they reassess or ask you to reapply in four to six years. And as a kidney transplant patient, if you're able to function and work full time, um, you wouldn't qualify for the disability tax credit. The requirements to qualify, actually, you have to be considered significantly impaired in your functioning for most of your day or most of your week. So as somebody who's doing well, that wouldn't apply. I thought I also saw a question about whether you could apply for CPP disability if you were on dialysis, but now I don't see it anymore. So I'm not sure if I made that up, but, um, but you yes. absolutely can. Yes, yes, you can. Yes, you can apply for CPP disability anytime you're living with a disability. And if you're on dialysis or you're in kidney failure, you are definitely living with a disability. Yes. And that would be a good situation for you to ask for some help from your, your social worker um, to fill out those forms because we would be getting the nephrologist um, to sign the medical report for you in that situation. Do we consider hemodialysis a disability? Yes. Well, hemo itself isn't the disability. The kidney failure yeah. that requires <laughs> you to be on dialysis is. Yes. Um, yes. And that's why you you qualify for the disability tax credit because you are in life sustaining therapy when you're on dialysis. So. So there's wow, well, there's a lot of questions going through here. Um, so at what stage of kidney disease are you considered disabled? So that's a really complicated question. It's um, it really depends on how you are functioning. There are some people who are working full time while they're on dialysis and they feel OK. So in that case, they may not be considered disabled and qualify for all the things we've discussed here. And then there are other people who feel terrible even before they're on dialysis. They're feeling symptomatic, uh, but they still have enough kidney function that they're not qualifying to be on dialysis, but they're, they're very fatigued and tired. So it's a really individual thing. And that would be to be discussed with your medical team, with your doctor and your nurse and your social worker. Um, yeah, I think it also it depends a lot on your on your other health conditions, right? I don't know if you specifically said that, Jody, because I just helped somebody um, who is in our kidney clinic, so not on dialysis, but he has many other health conditions that are preventing him from working. And um, so I think it's again, it's it's how you fill out the forms, how detailed you are, um, how supportive your doctors are, and and how you can back it up with medical information. I know there was a comment um, about CPP doesn't agree with us that if you're on dialysis, you're you have a disability. But again, it could be, um, as Jody said, you could be working full time and on dialysis. So it it really depends how you're feeling and how you're functioning. So. Um, I guess we shouldn't make a blanket statement like that. It is, it does vary, but it also depends how you fill out the, the application. So. Absolutely. But, and, and there was a question as well that do all of these benefits we're talking about only apply to renal patients or kidney patients? They do not. These are federal programs that are for anybody living with a disability in Canada. Um, and as we're mentioning, this is very, it's an individual thing for every person based on their own situation to see if they qualify um, and then to go through those application processes. So it, it, we can't possibly know each different situation, but your team will be able to, um, to help you with that. And then some of the questions about the disability tax credit that I'm seeing here. So most of these benefits we're talking about are for folks under the age of 65, because once you hit 65, the federal program, the Canada-wide government changes the kind of benefits that you are eligible for, and you're eligible for old age security um, and CPP um, automatically as being over 65. And some people who are low income can also apply for the guaranteed income supplement, which we didn't review. Uh, but again, if you're low income, uh, definitely, and you're over 65, please do reach out to your social worker to make sure you are getting um, the guaranteed income supplement if you do qualify. And that is something you can apply for retroactively. Um, there's a question here about someone who's gotten a transplant and they're maybe not doing so well, or someone who's had a transplant years ago and now their kidney function is declining and they're, they're not feeling well. So again, I, I can't give a, a clear answer either way about whether you would qualify for um, the disability tax credit or for disability benefits. It depends on how 
you're doing, how unwell you are. And, and like Corinne said earlier, if there's other issues going on that make you feel sick beyond your kidney function or your kidney um, disease, those come into play as well. There's also, there's a couple questions about the disability tax credit. Can you get it if you're retired? The disability tax credit is not, doesn't have anything to do with whether you're working. It's just, if you're working, you probably can benefit more from the, the tax credit, but it has to do whether with whether you are, have a disability or not. Um, and then there was a question, um, okay. Oh boy, now I've missed, <laughs> there's so many of them in here. <laughs> there's a oh, lot of I, questions. Yeah, I have been on CPP disability for about five years for a different reason. Now that I have kidney disease, do I need to change the disability or just leave it alone? So I would say the disability tax credit is still the same amount, but the difference is some of the disabilities that are listed, you do have to um, requalify and for life-sustaining therapy, in my experience, people don't get asked very often to redo the forms. So I guess that's the only difference that I can see. Jody, did you? Yeah, yeah I wanted to just add that actually was about CPP disability, not the disability oh, tax credit. Okay. Sorry. So if you still have the initial reasons about why you're on CPP disability, you don't have to change anything. You can certainly add kidney disease to the list, but you don't need to do anything at this time. The only time you need to change things, and this applies to kidney transplant patients. So let's say you're on CPP disability for being on dialysis, and then you get a kidney transplant. Eventually, you are going to need to... Um, you know, report that. Nobody reports it for you. The teams don't call the government. We don't have anything to do with them. Um, but, uh, but certainly, you know, if you're, the reasons you're on disability change and you're no longer disabled in the same way, then obviously that needs to um, get addressed. Uh, I see Michelle has her hand raised. I'm going to stop talking now. Oh, well, no, that's great, Jody. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yep. Great. I just wanted to um, add a point about the disability tax credit certificate that comes up often with patients that I work with. And these are patients who do, do qualify based on being on dialysis and the amount of time related to their treatments, but they no longer pay income tax. And so they often wonder if they should still apply. And so I just wanted to let folks know that even if you are not paying income tax still, you it's probably a good idea to still apply for the disability tax credit certificate, and you may be able to transfer your credit to a family member who is providing support to you. So that's something, um, I apologize if that's come up already, but I just wanted to mention that because it is a question that I am frequently asked. Yeah, that's a good point. And there are other reasons the if if you can play, sorry, we were talking about the RDSP, you can't apply for the RDSP if you haven't done the disability tax credit. And I think a lot of people feel that they don't pay taxes when they're seniors, but your, your CPP is taxable. So you may be not paying a whole lot of tax, but you are getting some tax removed and you, you could get that back. So I think there are a lot of reasons to, to apply for the, the tax credit. Okay, is there... Other questions in the Q&A? I see a transplant related question, which is not uh, related to the financial supports. So I would just encourage that person to talk to your team. Um, transplant is basically an option, one of the options for treating kidney failure. Um, Um, there were a couple of texts that came at the same time. Yeah. And Craig says, is it stressful in your role as a social worker to cope with the urgency of your patients' compelling stories and needs? I sense you all care deeply about this beyond it simply being your job. So Anna and Jody, do you want to answer that one? Yeah, wonderful question, Craig. Um, of course, this is stressful. Um, you know, we're not in the field for the money, so to speak, we're in the field for the human connection and the stories of each and every patient. As renal social workers, I do feel that we are very privileged because we get the opportunity to follow patients for a long time throughout their journey with kidney disease. So we may be needing 
uh, patients who are brand new to MCKC clinic, which is the multidisciplinary kidney care clinic who are just receiving the diagnosis uh, about the chronic disease um, and working with those patients um, should, uh, until they need to start renal replacement therapy, either in the form of dialysis or transplant. It is stressful at times, um, you know, um, however, the benefit of this work is really the, the stories and the resilience that we see each and every day. It's not an easy task to ask patients to show up for dialysis three times a week uh, for at least four hours. This is treatment alone, and then you add snowstorms on top of it, you add the pandemic, you add a whole bunch of other factors that everyone has to take into account. And um, Personally, for me, it is rewarding to work with a group of people that are strong and resilient, and this is how I get my, my drive and my strength to keep pushing forward, but uh, of course, there are different there are challenges every day, and um, you have to have a strong team of um, doctors, nurses, dietitians, pharmacists um, to be able to, to work uh, and, and show up each day, but I think we do it for the patients. And their family members. Thank Join you, Anna. Anna. That was what was that last thing you said, Anna? I know you have more to add. Actually, I was going to say you said all of that so beautifully. I have very little to add. Um, the I guess the the two things I wanted to say were, you know being able to work with patients like Bibi who go through such a difficult struggle and end up with such an amazing, strong, um, you know, journey. And, and that, like Anna was saying, that strength and resilience and the positive attitude is, is so inspiring and really makes, you know, it, it's a wonderful experience to be part of that. Um, and the other thing I would add as well is that um, there's a lot of amazing support that social workers give each other. Um, this, you know, our group that's on right now, the Canadian Association of Nephrology Social Workers gives support across the country. So we've got our, our immediate teams and then we've got Canada-wide support as well. So that was all I wanted to add. And, and I echo everything else that Anna said. And I agree, yeah. I think um, we're fortunate to to be on this journey. We're all we're all on this journey to some extent, right? It's just uh, when and and where. So, yeah. Um, are there any further questions? If there are not, we can we will wrap up this session, and I will hand over to Lydia to to do some final words for us. And just thank you again, Anna and Jody. Wonderful presentation. Lots of great information. Thank you, Michelle, for being in the background and, and BB again for, for sharing your story, very courageous. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for that, Corinne, and for the team um, for this really useful information. Uh, we've uploaded a copy of the links to the resources that you discussed on our website page uh, where you registered for this event. And we've just shared the link in the chat. Um, thank you everybody for joining us for this session, Financial Supports for Kidney Patients. 